Might also be useful. I know, don't look on head. Go to links. I just add that. What? Where are you? Oh, yeah. Create. to describe it. Okay, now in the course, go to the course. Let's see if you can get that. Might as well open the chat just in case somebody goes in there and enter. Leave that open. Let's see. <clears throat> Screen, everything. This is a test. So, uh, my name is Ramsey Fazal, and I'm one of the analysts here. Welcome. This is the intro to Signet. Um, it's, a, it's a nice but 
uh, not a size group, which is typically the case. This is why we do this once a month. It's going to be fairly inf informal. Um, it's to get you guys started. You might have different backgrounds. You may or may not be familiar with Linux, with a supercluster or not. Um, because it's a small group, I can, I can answer any questions you have. Uh, but for me to know a little bit where to uh, sort of steer the discussion and what to, uh, what to address most, uh, it's nice to go around the room and introduce yourselves and say your name, um, what department you're from, and what you intend to use Signet for. It will give me a little bit of an idea. Uh, my name is Ramses Van Zon. I have a background in, uh, in physics and chemical physics. I've done a lot of molecular dynamic simulations. I'm one of the analysts here, so I uh, also do a lot of the training and the teaching, uh, parallel programming, and other stuff as well. OK, so that's me. Hi, my name is Juan Zuluaga. I'm a graduate student in biology. So uh, I'm interested in uh, the effect of uh, climate on species distribution. So we use a lot of uh, you know, spatial data, okay. cluster data. Uh -huh. So that's, that's my interest. OK, great. Marco Santiago, I work here. <laughs> I'm just starting. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'm Andre Rushing. I actually work uh, here as well, or well, not here, but at the university at the Dunlap Institute, uh, and I work on China. Um, and I like use Sinet a lot, but I just honestly don't know the proper ways to use it. And people always come to me and ask me how to use Sinet, <laughs> how to analyze time data, and I'm like, you type these commands, and I think they're right. Okay. So I just want to make sure I'm telling people the right thing. Okay. Well, all right. Sure. Um, I'm Dave Ashbrook. I'm in the biological sciences. And basically, I'm going to use running R scripts quickly. So. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, all right. Under. Well, hello. Um, I'm not my name cool. I got graduated two years ago from the University of Toronto. I got a PhD in water resources engineering. At the moment, I got a contract from the University of Alberta to uh, develop a code for leak detection in water and uh, water pipeline. Uh, actually, develop a distributed code. Mm, okay. Um, I'm Karen. I graduated from computer science. And I'm currently working at Scripture in the Department of Neuroscience and Mental Health. And so I'm going to be using it to analyze um, trying to segment uh, the corpus callosus of um, fMRIs, but fMRIs. And um, do shift analysis. Okay. Hello, my name's Sharon. I'm in the Department of Civil Engineering. Um, I'm going to be using Signet to develop um, a model that couples 1D and 3D to analyze turbulent or, or transient flow in pipelines. Um, okay. So I'll be using something maybe like Python or C for the 1D where and um, CFD, maybe. Um, Star CCF or CFX for the 3D model. Okay. Hi, I'm Eduardo. I'm doing my PhD in ecology and evolution and biology. And um, I have been, been debating on using SciNet to run these uh, programs that have seen as the data sets are getting larger and larger. We thought it would be interesting to use um, a server that is much more powerful than the one that we have right now. So, what are you using for the analysis? Like, what uh, kind of panel. environment? Oh, panel. Okay. I'm Javier Monster. I'm a graduate student at the computer engineering department. Um, I work at the middleware research, middleware research systems lab, and mostly. I've been looking to use Scilab to model data. It's a very diverse group. We have biologists, engineers, astrophysics. We got everything. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll keep it general, and then uh, you just keep ask me questions. Okay. Uh, so this is the outline. I'll stand up because it's recorded, and it looks better in the recording if I'm standing. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what Signet is. Um, do you all have your Signet accounts? Raise your hand if you don't, not yet. OK, so uh, it's not terribly hard to do, but it is a, it is a process. Um, but that's just, you just go to the website and say, oh, how do I get my, my account? It's not terribly hard. Um, so, but I'll, I will explain a little bit about what Signet is, uh, what our role is, what we do. 
before I'll go, uh, and that, I'll do that before we go into sort of what systems we have, which uh, you might think is where I could stop, but I won't, uh, because the real heart of the matter is how we use these systems and what, what, what you can do with them. And so that's, that's part three. And then I'll talk a little bit about data management, and we'll see why this deserves its own special section. So we're Synet. We're a, uh, a consortium of high-performance computing. Uh, so basically, we can help uh, academic researchers anywhere in the country run big stuff. Uh, that's what high-performance computing is in a nutshell, big stuff. Um, we're U of T and the hospitals. That's, that's the consortium we are. But, we, but that doesn't mean that people from elsewhere in the country can't use our systems. There's actually six such consortia in Canada. There's Westgrid, there's Cocal Quebec, there's Sharknet, there's HPCVL and ACENET um, that have their own systems. And so if they have a system that is more suitable to your computation, uh, you might say, well, hey, these guys have a really nice huge memory system that you might need if, for your model that we don't have. And they, like folks, might say, well, you have to run on a 1,000 nodes. Well, you better go to sign it because we don't have a 1,000 nodes. Um, okay. So what do we do? Now, we run these machines, and we'll go into what the machines are. Um, but when you get to this kind of scale, the machines are different from your typical desktop or workstation. And so we find that it's useful for people to learn a little bit about how to use these systems, not just this intro, uh, but also more specialized skills, such as uh, scientific programming. Um, we have courses in, uh, in Parallel I.O., uh, graphics cards, computing, uh, Linux shell, for those that aren't so familiar, coming from a Windows background, perhaps. Uh, Parallel Python, Parallel R. Um, we have a grad course. Uh, it's based in physics, but any graduate student can take it. Um, which, which is just finished, so we do that every year, uh, about how to uh, set up uh, proper uh, scientific software and uh, a little bit of parallel programming, too. And then there's the Ontario Summer School, which uh, there's actually three of them in Ontario every year, uh, one based in Toronto, a week-long uh, um, workshop on parallel programming, but also parallel R, parallel Python, a bit of shell scripting, some visualization. Uh, it's sort of an intensive way of doing uh, or, or getting your skills up. Everything is listed on the education website. Um, <clears throat> and then there's us. Uh, so we give these courses mostly because uh, we find that if we teach people, they leave us alone. Um, but if you still have questions afterwards, you can email. So actually, no, you can always email us. Don't leave us alone. Uh, support at signed.utoronto.ca is, is the email address uh, to use. Uh, all the analysts and all the, all the uh, sysadmins see that same list. Uh, so keep that list in your CC when, when you're having uh, 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 an email response. Uh, because rather than sending to one particular person, uh, this way you will get faster response. It might be a question that everybody knows the answer to. Uh, we also do sort of one-on-one -on -one, uh, consultations. So if you need to sit down with somebody and go, okay, can we go over my workflow? Or I have this program that won't work? or um, <clears throat> We, we can, you can come here, you can make an appointment, and we will just sit down and, uh, and talk. Thanks. Uh, this is the uh, attendance sheet. So you can just, um, if you have registered, just check your name. Uh, if you haven't, you can, you can enter your name here. Um, we'll explain that in a second. But um, since most of the courses and training we're doing uh, doesn't actually uh, give you any university credit, and a lot of our users are graduate students, um, that would be waste. The only exception is, uh, is the scientific programming courses that we're giving. Uh, and one of the R courses is going to be for credit. But uh, we figured that it would be nice if you're taking a lot of them for you to be able to say, hey, I took these. And rather than listing them uh, uh, separately on your CV, uh, we're giving certificates. So if you do 36 hours worth of our training, so that's a good bit, um, you can get a certificate. And so we have to keep attendance for you to get a certificate so we know who attended what. So that's what the attendance is for. Now, it's good that you all came here, but the material that we're covering is also on our wiki. So there's a GPC quick start, and GPC is the uh, general purpose cluster that most of you will be using. Um, 
Uh, there's a sign up tutorial that you actually should have gotten when you got your account. And so the material is in there for you as reference. The PDFs of this thing, this this talk, are also on the the website. So, um, so but it's always better to hear it in person, I find, because you can ask questions. And then this is us. <clears throat> it's a relatively small group of analysts, basically people doing the software and the user support, and the uh, the sysadmins that are doing the hardware. Uh, so um, about seven of each, and then we have some. Uh, we have a technical director, which is Professor Paul Che, who's in physics, a business manager, and a project manager. So it's a relatively small group. You'll mostly see the analysts answering your calls, because they are doing the user support. But if it's something that touches the sysadmin, you might actually find some of the sysadmins coming. And uh, it's worth mentioning that most of our sysadmins actually have PhDs in uh, usually in, in one science or another. And so sometimes you ask a software question, about a specific path uh, package, and one of our sysadmins will answer you and they'll say, well, I know this too. So uh, the division is a bit arbitrary. So that's, that's the people. That's what we teach. Uh, what do we have? Uh, we have a couple of clusters, a couple of big machines. Uh, but the main one is the general purpose cluster. GPC. Uh, by the way, we have the best naming schemes in the world. We're so poetic. So we just take what it is, and we abbreviate that, and that's the name, GPC. Uh, it's, uh, so I should ex explain a little bit um, what this is. Uh, it says here it has 3,864 3, nodes. A node is basically the equivalent of a workstation. And these, these are multi-core machines. In this case, there are eight core machines. Um, and so you can think of this as almost 4,000 workstations, but then coupled together. Uh, each workstation has multiple cores, so when you do the core counts, it's more than the number of nodes. This concept of nodes will become important uh, because that's how you always get a whole node to yourself when you're doing computation. So it's a little over 30,000 cores, which is nice. Uh, if you count it up, how many floating board operations these things can do per second, uh, it turns out it's uh, over 300 teraflops. And that's, that's more for bragging rights. Nobody uses the whole machine to themselves, and nobody actually reaches the peak of that. But it gives you an idea of the scale of, of, uh, of what this machine is capable of. Going back to the per node uh, setup, um, so the, the, that's, that's your basic unit. There are 16 gigabytes of RAM in each of them by default. There's a couple with higher memory, which we can talk about in details. But most of them are 16 gigabytes. And some of that is taken by the, the, by the system, by, by the operating system. And so you really should count on only having 40 gigabytes available uh, of, of memory on, on, in, in memory. Um, 16 threads per node. So it's kind of funny that we have eight cores on the node, which you can use and you should use. Uh, but you can pretend like there's actually 16 of them and the operating system does. There's some, some benefit to doing that. You don't get twice as much performance, but you get more than one times performance uh, for most code. So it's something worth, worth trying out. It runs uh, Linux as an operating system. Uh, the particular flavor is CentOS 6. And, and then the, the thing that makes this uh, uh, appropriate for high performance computing, for large scale computing, is the fact that all of these nodes are connected through a, a fabric called InfiniBand. And InfiniBand is a fast way of connecting. Um, it's uh, the standard way you might connect to a network is Ethernet. So you know, plug in your Ethernet cable. Uh, this is a faster version of that if you want. Um, so this becomes important. Thank you. And uh, this becomes important when you are um, doing computations that need more, say, than the 16 gigabytes of RAM, or just uh, don't aren't fast enough if you only use eight cores. You have to use multiple nodes at the same time on the same problem. Now, not all of you will be in that situation, uh, uh, but, but some of you will. And so that means that these nodes have to communicate. They don't see each other They're like separate workstations. This interconnect makes it possible for them to communicate uh, uh, quickly and, uh, and make it possible to, to actually do these computations. It was a very fast machine when it first came out. It was, there's this list of the 500 fastest machines in the world, uh, at least the ones that want to be known that they exist. Um, and so when this machine, this GPC, was first commissioned in, or first 
came online in 2009, it was the number 16th in the world. Um, we're now at number 393, which sounds low, but it's really remarkable that a machine that is seven, year old, seven years old is still in this top 500. We're probably one of the oldest machines in this list. Um, there's a new machine planned uh, for some time, probably in 2017, to, uh, to replace this old machine, but it still uh, has a lot of uh, a lot of cores for you to use. Uh, it's still the second ranked open, and open I mean available for, for academic researchers um, uh, system in, in, in Canada. And um, just so you know, there's, there's some extra bits and pieces that we've added through the years that have slightly newer hardware. Uh, Gravity is a machine that has GPUs and Sandy is a, a newer uh, machine. They together add about 1,800 more cores. Um, it's just good for you to know that these exist. But uh, so since this is an old machine, I should warn you, it's seven years old. Uh, the chips at the time were top of the line. Okay, um, they actually nobody had these chips before us in a in a in a large scale cluster. But they are slower than your typical chips that you find in your workstations now or even in your laptops. So things core by core typically run slower on Cynet than they run on your machine. Unless you have a server that is 10 years old, but that's which happens. Uh, so keep this in mind. The power here is the sheer number of cores that you have, the sheer number of resources. The power is not in the individual chips. Not in, there will be when we have the new system, but for now it's just the bulk of it makes this a, a top machine. OK, so that's, that's our resources. Um, that's what we are. Do we do any, any questions? OK. So, okay. so we'll go through using Synet. Uh, just out of curiosity and to know, who here is using a Windows machine mostly? Oh, this is OK. Just one. That's okay. Um, and Max and Linux. Yes. Right. Well, I used to say they're the same, but they're not. They, Max has diverted just slightly enough to make things annoying. Um, meaning, I need separate instructions for Max and for for Linux sometimes. Now, in any case, uh, it doesn't really matter where you come from because you're going to log into Signet. Signet runs Linux. Uh, all you have to make sure is that you have a an application called SSH, Secure Shell, to log in to, to sign it. Um, if, you, if you're on Mac or Linux, you very likely have it, or it's very easy to install. Uh, if you're on Windows, uh, I suggest you install MobXterm. Um, it's a, it looks like this. It's quick to install. It's there's a free version, um, and it comes with a prompt. It's kind of a Linux environment in here. You're not going to use this local Linux environment, but it comes with SSH. Um, now, just typing SSH will tell me that I'm doing it wrong and what kind of options I can have. But the way you use it is this. You say SSH uh, dash Y, just to be sure that if you are going to use it graphics, um, it can pop up back on your machine. Um, my username at login.signet.utron.ca. Don't forget to log in. Um, the machine that, that you connect to, if you just do sign it, will not let you go get anywhere. So, so that's how you log in. And, and you'll, you'll end up uh, in Signet. Now, um, Signet is the organization. The machine is called the GPC. And, uh, and, and there's a distinction because we have other machines too. Um, which I won't go into until it, unless you, you need specific needs. Um, but that means that when you log in, you're actually not on this general purpose cluster. You're not on the GPC. You're on some sort of login gateway node, um, of which there are four. Sign it 01, 02, 03, and 04. So you log into the yellow node. And you can't do anything on those nodes. They're not part of the GPC, so it's not where you run. Um, you, you, can't even really compile there, or, or you could edit there, I guess. But um, they really you should think of them as hallways, as gateways. You, you get in. Now you want to go to the actual GPC. So the next thing you do 
is to log into one of these blue nodes, or cyan nodes, I guess, um, which are nodes that are part of the GPC cluster. So they are these eight cores, uh, 16 gig boxes in principle. Um, there's eight of them, eight of L nodes. And if you just type in GPC, there are eight of them because we have like a couple hundred active users uh, at any given time. There's like a thousand or over a thousand registered users. And so if they're all using the same node to get in, things can get crowded. So if you want to get the least busy of these eight nodes, you just type in GPC and it'll get you to one of these eight devel nodes. You can also be specific and SSH into GPC 08, for instance, and just get there specifically if you want. So we've logged into these gateways, now we're logging into the GPC. And, and um, because they're shared machines and there's many users, what we actually have done is we've beefed up the memory on these login nodes, there's more than 16 gigs because it has to be shared by so many people. Um, but that's the detail. Okay, so now we're in the devel nodes. And there's only eight of them. Um, hundreds of users are not gonna get a lot of things done on eight old nodes, right? So we wanna get to these red nodes. Those are what we call compute nodes. That's where you do your real computations. Um, there's about 4,000 4, of them, um, but um, you can't log into them. And you can't log into them because we want to share these nodes in a fair way among all the users. And to do that, so on the default nodes, you can do things like compiling, editing, uh, et cetera. But then you, to get to the compute nodes, you have to submit what's called a batch job. So the compute nodes are under control of the, of the scheduler, and we'll go into that. But um, basically, you tell the scheduler what you want to run, and it takes that run script, puts it on a queue, sees if there's available space on these compute nodes. If there isn't, it waits. The longer you wait, the higher up you get into the queue. And eventually, it's your turn to run on the compute nodes. So compute nodes are sort of hands off. The develop nodes are where you try things out, you compile, you make your script, you do a little test, that kind of stuff. Once you know what you want to do and the scale at which you want to do it, you give it to the scheduler and it just goes and does this thing. So once you log in to the GPC, you have a home directory. You have a directory where your stuff lives. Um, it's one of the many home directories, uh, but uh, this, this is, you have a space for yourself. Um, for me, it's called slash home slash s slash sign it slash arzon. Um, it is called that because my username is arzon, my group name is sign it, and the first letter of my group is s. We've done this a little bit so that groups don't over, uh, overcrowd the home space. Having a, a thousand subdirectories in home just gets a little unwieldy, and so we've got this, this tree structure. So yours will be home slash g slash group name slash username, uh, where group name and username and g are replaced by your uh, respective groups and usernames. Then there's a second directory called scratch. It has the same structure except to start with scratch. Now this is kind of long and 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 can change because some of the some of the scratch space is on a different partition called scratch too. Uh, so we've we've given you these variables called home and scratch that you access by putting a dollar sign in front and then home. So just, and we fill them with where, where you are supposed to be. So just let me give this, this is very small. Increase. Okay. Maybe one more. Okay. So if I SSH in, Got the dash y is not so important for now. That ranks. So here I'm, I type in GPC and it gives me to one of the the nodes. 05. Mobile XTERM is kind of nice because it actually shows my files remotely, but um, I'm not going to use that ability here. 
OK, so here I am. And I can do things like uh, figure out where my home directory is by echoing it. So that's so if you write a script, use these variables rather than the absolute paths, just in case they ever change or your group changes and you have to be moved to another group because you were a PhD student in one group and you went to another group, uh, maybe somewhere else in Canada or as a collaborator and, and uh, things change. Your scripts will work if you just use those variables. OK? You have two places for a reason. We'll, we'll uh, talk about that uh, in a second, why there's two spots for you. OK, so you're in the GPC. You're on the Devel node. Um, you know where you are. You're in your home, home directory, which is this long uh, path. Now what, what can you do? So what you can do depends on what software is installed. And here's uh, a bit of a snag. Uh, there is basically no software installed. Apart from the essentials, like copying a file, listing your directories, uh, SSHing, um, everything else is sort of hidden. And the reason for that is that is that with a thousand users all wanting different software to be installed, what tends to happen is that one particular software basically can't cooperate with another piece of software. So if you all installed all the possible software with all the possible versions, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, it's not possible because it might have the same name. And, and basically, they just trip over one another. So our solution is not to install software in standard spots. The real solution is to install them somewhere else where, by default, you can access them. But by do, using this so-called module command, you now sort of access that. So it's like saying, uh, I put them in different spots. I don't see them by default. And then as a user, you select which spots you want to become visible. That's what module does. So all it does is sets up, set up your environment and doesn't do anything uh, else. And this allows us to have conflicting multiple versions available uh, at, and, and at the same time. If you want to know what's available, you type in module avail. And it'll give you a very long list of all the possible uh, modules by name and, and with different versions. And it's, it is a very long list. But if you wanted to know if you know, there's a blast installed, you just do module avail and you see if blast is in the list and which versions are there. Some other commands for making this, this uh, software available. Uh, module load, if you found a, a particular piece of software in this module avail list that you like, and you want to load it, you want to use it and make it visible to, uh, to you from the prompt, um, you type module load and then the module name. If you, you're going to have several modules loaded, most likely. If you want to sort of start from scratch, um, rather than doing module unload for each of them, you just do module purge and it gets rid of all of the loaded modules. Module avail, we just saw, give you this whole list. Um, module list gives you the list of loaded modules. So uh, that's good for you to check if modules were actually loaded or um, if it, anything went wrong. Then there's some helpful other commands to find and and explore this large module list. Um, module help will just give you a quick description of the module. So you might have found in module available, oh, this looks like it's the package I need. Module help will tell you a little bit more about the package, so you can check that. Um, you can, there's a module find command where you can say, well, I kind of know what this package is, 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 is called, or maybe it's in the description, so we'll see an example of that. So basically, basically searches through them. Um, and then we'll see this thing, uh, module advice is needed because some modules need other modules to be loaded first. And, they, and this, uh, this command can give you some advice on how to get your modules loaded. And we'll see how that goes through. Uh, don't, so those, those are, there are some other subcommands, but this is, these are the basic ones. Now, um, because there's no software loaded and you have to do the modules, this means every time you log in, you have to type a couple of module load commands to get your work started. This sounds very tedious. There's an easy way to um, automate that. Let's put these module load commands in what's called your .bashrc. So it's a file that lives in your home directory. It's called .bashrc, anything that starts with a dot and index is hidden. So you don't see it, but it's there. Don't. Don't put any module load commands in your bash.rc. In fact, leave your bash.rc alone. Put nothing in your bash.rc that's not already there. Um, anything you put in your bash.rc 
gets executed every time you log in, every time you load any kind of script, every time you do almost anything. And so there will be side effects. If you ever start using a newer version of a module and your old module load commands would be in Bash RC, you get conflicts all over the place and you know, your jobs fail and it's just, it's just not nice. Leave it alone, be explicit. Now, you might have a set of modules that you load frequently, yeah? five, six modules. Put them in a little script and load that script. Right? That way, when you log in, you say, source my modules, and that's all you have to type and you're, you're ready to go. Okay. Uh, so just, just load them by hand or, or in the script. There's then also the possibility um, to give short names in your module load commands. So don't mention the version name numbers. You will see that some of these in the list have a uh, default behind them. That's not part of the name. That means that if I just type module load R, I get this very old version 2.13.1. Um, unfortunately, having a seven-year-old system means all our defaults are very old. And so unless you're continuing a project in a group that has been going on for years and needs those specific versions, load a newer version. Just do it. Um, which means you have to be specific. And specific, specific is a good idea anyway. You want to know what uh, version of a package you are using um, just to be able to reproduce it later. Okay, so don't use the defaults unless you have to because of backwards compatibility. Okay, so those are module commands. And then the last sort of important thing about modules is that you get, you have these dependencies or requirements. Suppose I wanted to load Python 278. I found it in the module avail list. So I'm going, okay, that seems to be the newest uh, Python 2. So let me load that and you get an error message. It's a little cryptic at first, but mostly it's just verbose. Um, if an error, Python 278 depends on one of the modules, Intel 1502. Python 2 error 102, TCL, command, execution failed, prereq, Intel, and then some other stuff follows. What do you think this says? All it says is that, hey, I really just need this Intel module. So it's a lot of words to say, I want this Intel module too. Now, suppose I wasn't quite clear, or I wasn't quite clear what was happening here. I can ask the module command, okay, how do I load this thing? Because it's not working for me, module advice. And it'll tell you, well, to load this module, load the Intel module, then load the Python module which is kind of what the error message said as well, right? So I load both and I can combi combine them, module load and I can say, say uh, it's a little shorter and then I don't get an error message anymore. And if you don't come from a Linux environment, when you don't get an error message in Linux, it means everything was fine, okay? So, so that's how I get Python loaded or any package that has uh, dependencies. R would have dependencies too, so I can do module device R slash three point, whatever I want. Um, and it's the easiest way to resolve. But it gives you one path. So advice might not always give you the versions that you have that you want. Um, but it'll take into account if you had already loaded an older version of the Intel compiler for one reason or another, it will check out whether it's possible to do that uh, with that version. Okay. It's a nice, a nice little tool. Now suppose that I wanted to load another module that can do some plotting. And you're just sort of curious, what's, what's out there for plotting? Um, so I'll do module find plot. And they'll look, this will look, rather than giving advice, will look through this module avail and sort of pick out um, things that have the word plot in them. In this case, I get PG plot, I get new plot, another PG plot, uh, graphics, um, but also look through um, the description, so the, the help for them. So whereas this graphics doesn't have any plot in it, it has a plot in the description. So it looks a little bit more deeply. And it also tells you exactly what and what you cannot load. Because of the dependencies, some might not be able to, to be loaded. And so uh, everything that has a plus, you can load. If it has a minus, you cannot load it. And if it's a question mark, then 
basically, we need to load other stuff. There's dependencies that are not resolved. So I would probably, if I needed this particular PG plot library, forget about what it is, I would type module advice PG plot to see what I need to load and load those. Okay. Why don't we automate this a little bit more? It's because there's often several choices. So this is one way to do it. There's other ways. And so you have, so we can't make that, uh, you have to make that choice basically. And which ones are the exact, uh, exact modules you need. Okay. So is that, is that a little bit clear? You don't have to play with it. First time you're on it, it takes a little while to figure out what your modules are and what combination, but once you have that, you have your environment set, you put that in the script, you load it every time you log in, you load it in your, in your job scripts, et cetera. Uh, commercial software, I, I heard a couple of them come by already. Um, we don't have them, except for the compilers and the debuggers, which pretty much everybody needs. There's no MATLAB, no Gaussian, no IDL, and no star CCM. Um, and it's basically because we can't pay for all of like, the licenses um, for, for that many users and for that many different packages. If you have a license, though, that allows you to run on a cluster, you are allowed to install it yourself in your home directory. Okay? If, that, if your license allows you to do that, you're allowed to do it on Signet. If you need to have, to have help with that, if maybe you have your, your particular commercial software has to contact a license server that lives in your lab, um, there are some hoops to go through to make sure you go through the gateway to your compute node and back so that it, we can help you with that. Okay, so just write to support that sign and it will set this up for you. Or if your lab has already done that, uh, probably somebody in your lab knows, okay, you just use this script and these commands. Signet has already helped me uh, set this up. So it's not impossible, it's just we don't have it. And it's up to the users to make sure they have the license for the particular software they want to use. And another thing you can, you can uh, try and do, say you come from a MATLAB environment, you could, uh, you could switch to open source versions of it, not so much versions or that use similar syntax, or you could use uh, just other scripting languages like Python, R, Octave. And they are available and they do work. All right, so that's the software part. That's what's available, how you get it. Um, questions? So let's look at a few examples uh, or, or how you compile. So a lot of you will be compiling yourself. Uh, what you should try and avoid to do is just copy binaries, like the executables or applications from your machine to Signet and run them there for two reasons. One, um, they might just be incompatible incompatible, uh, but also they're likely not compiled to use uh, the particular systems um, optimally. So you want to compile yourself. Um, when you're compiling, since our machines have Intel chips, typically you'd want to compile with the Intel compilers. And so if you have C code, you don't want to compile with ICC, C++ with ICPC, and Fortran with IFORT. Um, all of those come together in an Intel module, and the latest one we have currently, I think, is Intel 1502. So you load that, and then you have these compilers available. Um, then you want to make sure you're optimized for, uh, for the GPC specifically. And so not only do you want to have some sort of level of optimization, so that's typically done with the dash capital O flag in uh, whatever make file or build system you have, uh, give it the dash X host flag too, which means that the compiler is allowed to use every bit and every trick for the specific machines that it's, it's running on. So this is the trouble with most sort of pre-compiled binaries. Um, their optimization is low and has to run on pretty much anything. So it's not taking advantage of, of your architecture. And if you have OpenMP code, dash F OpenMP will work. If you have MPI code, so distributed memory uh, 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 parallel codes, uh, there's two, flavors of, of, of this distributed memory uh, programming model, the message passing interface, open MPI and Intel MPI, which are in, in their respective modules. And when you load those, you have uh, as compilers, MPI F77, F70, CCC, and MPI CXX. Okay, so that's if you, if you need those. Now, one uh, difficulty when compiling on a system where there's no software installed is that if this needs a library, if this is a library you're loading, um, the compiler doesn't know where to look for it. It's not in the standard spot. 
right? This was in some some uh, uh, hidden spot that uh, yes, the executables are now in the path, but how does the compiler know where things are? And so when you load the modules, you get a couple of extra environment variables. They all start with sign at underscore, and then the module name. They tell you where stuff are the stuff is for this for this partic particular module. So uh, often there's a base directory where the software lives, uh, sign and module name base. There's uh, an include directory where header files live, a library directory where the library lives, and the bin directory where the binaries live. So um, you will have to tell the compiler about these. It doesn't pick them up automatically. And this is kind of how you would do that. So here's a little example of compiling a code that needs uh, the GSL library. And uh, so I load Intel and GSL, it's an older slide, so it uses a slightly older Intel, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, compiles some C code and some other bit of code called module.c for some reason that needs the GSL library. And so it needs to know uh, where the header files are, and you do that with dash i. If you don't know what header files are, you're probably weren't uh, programming in C. And, uh, but you might still have to know it if you have to compile C code. So dash i, capital I, uh, dollar sign it, underscore GSL, underscore ink. Add that to your compilation line, uh, line and for, G, for GSL. If you have another uh, module loaded, the GSL uh, part of the name would change to the name of that module. And then for linking, so actually, actually linking in the, the library, a similar, uh, uh, similar line is necessary, a similar option a dash capital L for library, a dollar sign at underscore GSL lib. The rest, and with that, adding this, it now will be able to find a GSL library and link it in, which is what this, this little thing does. Okay. You probably have some sort of build script or make file or CMake file. So you'd have to uh, adapt those and add these things uh, in the appropriate response. So, so, so we've got our code, it's compiled, it, it can run. The next important part is testing, and it's very important because um, you want to run this thing on scale, right? You want to do, uh, I don't know, a thousand cases of something of, with the code you've just compiled, uh, so you want to run on these compute nodes. Uh, you better be sure that things are working correctly before you launch a thousand jobs and they're running off in, in uh, compute nodes, because if something's wrong, you've just wasted a thousand nodes, right? Um, you don't want to do that. So you're going to do a quick test, right? Something that is short and uh, that you can run in like a minute, doesn't need the whole node, needs a couple of gigs of memory at most, um, just to see if your basic stuff is working. And if it isn't, um, run it through a debugger or you know, do that before you start a, a large scale computation. The same with scripts, right? Not just with compiled language, it's all the scripts. Make a short version of your script, make sure it runs. Now, um, some problems don't show themselves at a small scale, right? So you might have done this, you might have worked well with like a small scale system, and now you ran a bigger system and it crashed. But you know, it, it, it crashes after an hour, or it crashes when you use multiple nodes. How do you do that? You can't do that on the devel node because the devel nodes are there for compiling and short tests. So we have these debug nodes, which are really just GPC nodes that are set aside that you can get with, with the debug job command. So although I said you can't log into the red nodes, the compute nodes, um, you can get a temporary login to one of them for like at most two hours or 30 minutes if you use eight nodes at the same time with this debug job command. So it's kind of like a, a fake SSH uh, into one of those. You still have to wait in the queue, um, but because the limit on the time, the turnover with these, these guys is, is pretty quick. And usually, within a minute or so, you have this interactive session. Why, you want interact why do you want this? Uh, first, larger tests, but also um, the devel nodes are shared, right? So whatever you run on those nodes, runs at the same time as somebody else's code or somebody else's test or somebody else's compile. So you can't count on timings to be correct. You can't quite count on the exact amount of memory that is available. You don't know how busy it is on the node. So basically, um, it's, it's an uncontrolled environment. For a short test, if it works on, on, in that uncontrolled environment, it'll likely work 
work on a dedicated node as well. But with a debug job, you get that node for yourself. There are no other users on that. You have exclusive access to this one node. OK? So you can, you can test there. OK, so you want the same controlled environment when you're running. And so uh, when you're running real uh, um, production code or production simulations or production computations, um, you want to get to these compute nodes uh, in earnest for longer times and, and for as many as you want. Uh, so QSub does that. So you will put all of your commands in a little batch script, a little, little script, and give it to the scheduler by giving that name to QSub. Uh, our scheduler is Moab. Um, that's what it's called. And underneath, there's another uh, resource manager called Torque. So in the documentation, you'll see Moab and Torque uh, commands, uh, just so you know what they're called. Uh, but QSub takes that script and puts it in the queue. And then at some point, we'll uh, deem it uh, suitable to run somewhere and gives you one or more compute nodes, depending on how much you asked for. And those compute nodes are, again, now yours. Right? So suppose you, had, you, you asked for one node, which is one job. It's not parallel. Um, it goes through the scheduler. The script is run uh, once it has a node. So your node is yours. The node is yours. No other user are on it. That's great. Nobody can influence your job. It also means these eight cores that are on that node, each node had eight cores, um, are your, responsible, your responsibility. And you have to use them well. If you only use one of them, so if you have pure serial code and you have no, and you've made no efforts to use all of these cores at the same time, um, you're going to basically run only an eighth of the computations you could be running. Right? And basically, that if we, if we let, let everybody do that, our system would effectively be eight times smaller than it is. So for efficiency, you need to make sure to use all those eight cores. If you have serial jobs, the so jobs that run on a single node, um, an easy way to run, to use multiple jobs on a Linux machine is just run commands in the background. And they'll each get a core assigned to them. So you run eight things in the background, they'll all run on different cores, and you're fine. Um, if you have more than eight things to run, you can use a little tool called GNU Parallel. That's basically a scheduler in a scheduler. Say you have 100 cases to go through. They all take different times. You want the course to be kept busy with those jobs. Basically, you can give those 100 commands to GNU Parallel, and it'll run eight of them. One of them finishes. It takes the next job. Um, another finishes. It assigns a new one to another core. It keeps all the course busy. Um, you don't have to script that yourself. There is a tool for that. So use that. Um, if you're running parallel jobs or threaded jobs, um, and if you don't know, look at the documentation of what you're running to see if it's able to do that. Uh, make sure you run eight uh, processes or eight threads on a node. And some other li limits are um, you can't run longer than two days. Um, if your job needs it more than that, it'll have to be able to restart. Okay, so it has to be, it's a, that job itself has to write out uh, whatever checkpoint it needs to pick up from in the next job. And then finally, and this is kind of why there are two spots, you must run from your scratch directory, because when you're running on these red nodes, you cannot read to, you cannot write to home. That seems annoying, but we'll see that home is a small space um, and it's backed up. And Scratch is a large space, but it's too large to back up. We don't want you accidentally to fill up your home space by running uh, 10 times more jobs than you thought and, and writing it there. So for your protection, home is read-only from the compute nodes. That means you have to run on Scratch. Okay, So this is what a, a submission script might look like. It's not as hard as it looks. So there's two parts to it. There's the top, the sort of the header part, which is for the scheduler and the start with these PBS lines. And then there's the sort of worker part here in black. So uh, if you haven't seen bash scripts before, this first line just says, this is a, a shell script. And this particular favor of the shell that's on our Linux is called bash. And that's all it says. It says how to interpret the rest is by running it in the, in the default shell. Then we've got the, these pound PBS lines. 
PBS is the old name for Torque, and therefore this index still exists. Um, and Torque was the thing that, that was part of our scheduler. And it asks for resources. In this case, one node with eight cores for one hour. That's what it's asking. It's also giving it a name. And these are the lines that QSub reads. So QSub was this command that, that is your interface to the scheduler. It just looks at these blue lines, at these pound PBS ones, and says, OK, this job needs to run on one node for an hour and wants to have this certain name. So I type QSub, QSub script name, and the scheduler starts looking for that one node with eight cores for one hour. They might all be busy, all the nodes right now. Well, look in the future and says, OK, there's, there's one there. But really, I'll just look at um, when something is available, who's on the top of the priority queue. OK, so priority is set by how long you've been waiting, how big your job is, uh, how much you run in the past, and what allocation was given to your group uh, as part of a, a yearly allocation round. So if your group needs a lot of resources, you can ask for uh, not dedicated resources, but for basically priority in the queue. It's called an allocation. And so if you have that, your jobs run faster. Uh, but really, they run faster in a way that um, guarantees a certain percentage usage of the system. So it gets a name. So once the scheduler find, finds a node, it runs the script. So once it finds it, it runs this past this black part. These are all, com uh, all comments. As far as the shell is com concerned, that's why they look like that. Um, and it just runs. It sets some, it changes the directory. It sets an environment variable. And it runs a command. Uh, this is an environment variable set by the scheduler. and basically means this is the directory where I typed QSub from. This may or may not be useful for you, but um, because you're running on a separate compute node, when this starts, the script, it starts in your home directory as if you just logged in there. So that's why you do want to change directory to the directory that you really want to be in. Then while you're in the queue or while it's running, there's a couple of commands you can use to monitor this job. It's a hands-on thing, right? If you gave it to the scheduler, you just hope it'll do its thing. Um, how do I know? How do I check? Uh, so a number of commands. There's show queue or queue sum that shows you the whole uh, the whole queue, everybody that's in the queue, what's running, what's waiting, what's blocked. Um, you can look for specific job uh, IDs, like queue stat uh, on your job ID. Um, so each job gets a job ID when it's submitted. Um, you can cancel your jobs if you, you know, change your mind or you find out something's wrong. Um, you can look at how your job is doing when it's running, like how much CPU is using, how much memory by things like job perf. Um, you can SSH to the compute nodes um, only when something, one of your jobs is running there. So you can SSH to the node that you're run, that a job is running on. Remember, you can't SSH to the compute nodes, but that's not true if you're actually running on the compute nodes. Those nodes are yours. They're your responsibility. You can do what you want as a user on them. Uh, you can find what your job script is, if you forgot. Uh, you can get your outputs and your error messages of the job that's running. Uh, all those things are more described on the wiki page that, that's listed. OK. And then when it's done, or even before, you might want to kind of know how much you or your group has done in the past, because it influences how fast your jobs will run. Uh, sign at GPC priority will show you uh, how much your group has used or abused the system uh, in, the, in the recent past. It'll also tell you whether this impacts your priorities. Um, sign at usage shows how much you've been using in the current year. Um, and then there's uh, uh, usage of disks, uh, quota and disk usage show you uh, how much of your, your disk you've been using. So a couple of commands, and, and they're just here for reference, really, but they are there. OK, so you're in the queue, right? You've queue soft. We're looking for, uh, for nodes, hopefully. And I type show queue, and I find that my jobs are blocked. And you write an angry email to support at Synet saying, why are my jobs blocked? There's something, you know, grudge against me or something. And so that's why I have to explain that when you uh, are in the queue, your jobs can be in three states. 
they can be running, which is, of course, great. Now everything is fine. The scheduler has nothing else to do but to wait for your job to end. Um, they can be idle. And idle doesn't mean, it means they're not doing anything, but it really means they're just waiting for a spot. They're all swell. They're just in the queue. And they bubble up, right? As longer you wait, the more priority you get. At some point, you'll be in the top. So idle is fine. And then they can be blocked. And blocked sounds like something's wrong. Most of the times, that's not the case. Uh, blocked is there to help the scheduler out. And unfortunately, it needs to tell you about this. Uh, so we have tens of thousands of jobs in the queue. And we want them to run. And what the queue, the scheduler has to do is that every, every time it has to check through those tens of thousands of jobs to see which one is entitled to run now. Right? So it has to check what's available, what, what has stopped, and who is there. So it has to do this ordering uh, based on priority, how long you waited. It's a computation that has to do. Um, it, we've set it up to do this, I think, once every minute. So it always takes a minute for this to compute. But even so, it can't necessarily handle that many jobs in that one minute. It takes longer to compute who's first in that set mm -hmm. than that. So what it does is it said, so what we've done is we've said, okay, scheduler, we're gonna make it easier to, for you. We're only gonna allow people to, run, to have 50 jobs in the queue. And that way we limit the total number of jobs in the queue such that it takes a reasonable amount of time. But if we did that, that would be very inconvenient because you want to submit 200 jobs and then you have to wait for 50 to be done and then submit the next 50. So we don't want our either. So anything above that 50 gets put in the blocked queue. They're really just set aside. They're like, I've got too much to do right now. I'm going to put these newer jobs that you submitted in the blocked queue. And then once your 50 ones have been scheduled and gone, I'll look at the next chunk of 50. OK, so that's, that's all this means. It means um, it's not considering them right now, but they're queued. Eventually, they'll get processed, and eventually, they'll run. OK, using a large shared system is all about patience. Does that make sense? If something is seriously wrong, like you're asking for a node with seven cores instead of eight, which we don't have, um, QSub is going to say, hey, you're asking for the wrong thing, and uh, try again rather than putting it in blocks. Okay. So let's do a, a couple of, let's do one example. I had two, but I'll do one because we're getting out of time. And then we'll look at the data management shortly. So I suppose um, we were again compiling some code here. In this case, it's Fortran. Um, I want to run from scratch. I'm copying everything over to scratch. Um, use, notice that I'm using the environment variables for that. I make a little directory just to keep things clean. I organize it how you want. But. And then I create a little job script. There's a couple of editors there. Do module avail if you want to see if your favorite editor is there. Um, but in this case, I'm using a little shell command called cat and redirect it to a file to create my job file. But it creates my job.pbs. I change directory, load my modules again. I have to do that because it's like logging in again to another compute node. Right? Whenever this runs, it runs on a compute node, not on this node. The fact that I already loaded my modules, it doesn't care about a new, a new login. And then I'll run, in this case, some MPI code. So I QSub it, and I get this number back. This is my job ID. This is what I can use to query exactly what's going on with this job. Um, and I can do things like QSTAT. It will give you the, the status of my jobs in the queue, or check job with that ID, or show queue. And I can show queue gives you everything of every user. If you just want your jobs, dash you user will, uh, will do the trick. OK. There's a lot of different ways to do different things. but. Um, in this case, so I do QSTAT and it says, okay, here's your job. Um, this is your name, uh, username. How long have you been running? And what's the status? In this case, the status is Q, meaning it's queued. Okay. All right, so it's queued. Now, if I uh, keep asking QSTAT what's up, um, eventually the S should change into an R for running. And then once it's done, it will change into a C for complete. So I can QSTAT. There's more information in the show queue command. There's more information in uh, check job. Um, but yeah. 
So once it's completed, say this has changed to R and C completed, um, and I do an LS in this directory, I will find a couple of things. Um, some should be should have already been there. My code was there when I compiled. My job.pbs was there from when I created the job script. And uh, out, this little file here, was created by the code itself. So that's good. That should be there. If it's run, it should have created this file called out. But then two more, two more files are here, and they're very important. Um, they're the .e and the .o file. So .e is your error messages. This is always your output messages. And um, if you have any output during your run that would otherwise appear on the screen, it goes in the .o. But if you have any error messages that would appear also on screen but are errors, they are gathered into .e. So remember, it's like logging in, like running on a computer node is like logging in there, but you don't have a terminal. So where does all that stuff go? Well, it goes into these two files. So when your job is done, it collects whatever would have been outputted and put it there. So if something went wrong, these messages are, these, these things will give you a clue on what went wrong. So it's hands on, but you'll get your feedback after the fact. I'll skip the second one. Um, it's a, an example of running GNU parallel, but um, we'll skip that for now. So, so that's kind of how you run. Um, we're, we'll finish up with some considerations about what to do with data management, but um, is the basic flow of how you run. OK, so storage. Um, what can you put on Signet, how much, and for how long? So your home directory, you're allowed to have 50 gigabytes. And remember, you can only write to it on the devel nodes. So that's this, this little line here, devel. But on the computer nodes, you can't. So that's where you put your code, um, maybe some, some common uh, data. But uh, mostly, you're probably going to work on Scratch, where you could have up to 20 terabytes. That's a safety limit. There's not enough room for Scratch for every user to have 20 terabytes. Okay? But it's just you have some users need a lot of space and some need a little space. Um, we just say 20 terabytes, but it's Scratch. It's meant for temporary data or for data that um, has to be run now. And then if you want to keep some of the data, well, that, that is a separate problem, because after three months, uh, we will delete your data. OK, so it's meant for temporary data. Uh, we will delete it if you haven't used it. You have a data set that you're reading all the time, that's good. That's not going to get deleted. You have something that you wrote out three months ago, a whole bunch of log files, and you never touched them, they're going to get deleted. You'll get an, an email saying, here's your list of files that are going to be deleted in two weeks. You have a chance to save your files. I mean, we're, not, we're not just doing this without you knowing, but that's the, that's the policy. And we do that so that everybody has a chance to use this Scratch. We don't back this up. It's too large. Um, and so that's, that's, so you work on Scratch. Whatever needs saving, you add a copy back to home if it fits, or you copy it somewhere else. You might want your analysis to be uh, on your, your lab machine, copy it there. You might want to save it in, uh, uh, in an archival system. And for that, we do have something available, although it's currently a little bit out of commission, uh, HPSS, which is a, a, tap, a tape backed storage system. Um, it's a bit of a funny beast, but you, every group can get two terabytes on it as soon as we get more tape. We're kind of full now, but the tapes have arrived. We have to install them. Um, so you can, so you won't be able to save your 20 terabytes unless you ask for an allocation of, of, of uh, storage, which again is this yearly uh, allocation round. But even if you don't, you have a way to back up some of this stuff. Um, there's no time limit. Uh, depending on who you are or whether we like you might know. There's, there's a second copy, but that's more of a uh, safety feature than a backup. Um, and you can't see this, this system from any of the, of the regular nodes, so you have to write a little script to copy your scratch data that you want to save into HPSS. Okay. That's, that's uh, the storage setup um, at Synapse. There's some uh, things to, to know as well um, to use this effectively. The whole, all, all of these locations 
are visible on every node. Your home is the same set of files on every node. Your scratch, same set of files, same set of directories everywhere. You don't have to copy anything from your uh, home directory to a compute node. You don't have to stage in and stage out. Everything is a global shared file system, which is very convenient, right? But it also means that 4,000 uh, uh, nodes are accessing the same file system. Now, this is a, a, a pretty big file system, okay? Um, but it can only do so much. So if everybody starts writing from their no from the, or reading from their node like crazy to the file system, you will feel it. It's a shared system. Um, how fast it is at any given time depends on how much other people are using it. So although the node is yourself and that's a controlled environment, the disk is shared. So sort of the price to pay for not having to copy things over, so it makes it saves you that time, but occasionally things are slow. So the best thing to do is for all users to try and be as well behaved in terms of I.O. as they can. And so one of the things that are bad for the file system are uh, writing little files, lots of little files. Because every time you write a file, it's potentially a file that all the other nodes can see. If you write, so if you write a thousand files, I have a thousand little transactions to, uh, to tell the other nodes about or that other nodes might have to know about. If I have one file, it's one. So a thousand times faster to do that. Um, try accessing data sort of in a contiguous fashion. Um, we have actually sort of set aside a, a cache or a buffer on each node of about one gigabyte um, that, uh, that, that sort of gets, gets used, but only gets used if the file system can predict where your next bit of read or write is going to be. So if it's contiguous, if it's one big file, just take that one big file and put it into cache. Fine. If it's a whole bunch of little files or going back and forth in the file, it can't predict what to put in the cache. And basically, uh, you might as well have no cache. So uh, do things in a, in a sort of streamed, streamed, um, concerted way. Uh, small files are bad. Uh, lots of files also bad. Um, and so for that reason, we've actually put a limit, a quota on the number of files in your scratch as well. You can't have more than a million files. And for some of you, that's going to be a, a bottleneck. You're going to go, no, but I have more than a million files. And so you'll have to pack them up. You pack them up in a tar file or a zip file, um, store them like, like that. And when you're processing them, you can unzip them. Right? Um, if it's a small file, you might be able to uh, unzip them to, to RAM. If it's not, you'll have to uh, consider another workflow. Okay. The only time we sort of alleviate this, uh, this million file limit is when you've promised that you need that extra space to clean up your files. I have a million files but I have to first zip them up, and I can't write a zip file because I'm out of files. Okay, we'll lift your <laughs> limit for a little while, you zip your stuff up, and we'll put it back in. Okay, so that's, um, what else? So what, what it is really good at, this file system is writing big chunks, uh, parallel stuff, very good at that. Small files, not so good at, it's not designed for it. Um, so that's big files, little files, uh, so, uh, big files, not too many of them. That's the best thing you can do. Uh, write in binary that makes your files smaller so that can, you can do more with your space. Um, that is if you have numerical data. Um, and then everything else is sort of a tweak, but um, if you have an application that's not under your control, you can't control that it's running, uh, writing small files, uh, consider writing to a RAM disk. It's a location in, on the file system that is actually mapped onto, onto RAM and doesn't, it's not shared, it doesn't get hurt, uh, but you know, there's a limit to how much you can use and that goes off of the actual memory involved. But anything under 11 gigabytes um, would, would fit. So this can be a, a, a safe uh, a way to save your stuff. Um, yeah. um, and then, Finally, how do I actually get stuff on and off if, it, if I'm not going to put it in HPSS? Uh, or how do I get it into, the, into Signet? And so there's, there's basically three ways. Um, it depends on the size of your data. If the data is small, and I'm talking 10 gig or, or less, um, you can just copy it through, the, through those gateways. The gateways, those login nodes, um, also see the same file system, same thing, right? So you, if I copy it to there, um, it, is, it is already where it has to be. So scopy is the copy 
equivalent of SSH, and you just has to copy things over, um, which isn't bad. Well, this 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 will work, but it won't work if you have more than 10 gigabytes for, uh, uh, well, mainly because you'll time out and it's it's slower than it needs to be. So there's a timeout on the login nodes. Um, they'll allow you to do about 10 gigs, but not more. If you have more, um, you have to go through what, are, what we call our data mover nodes. These are great nodes because they they have a faster connection to the outside world, and so your stuff will get copied quicker. Um, they also don't have a timeout, so you have 50 gigabytes to copy. They won't stop after 10 gigabytes. <clears throat> Um, but they're not <laughs> visible from the outside. So you kind of have to go to the data mover in the day after you logged into a signet and then copy your files from abroad. From the, That's basically what you do. Um, or you can use this thing called Globus. Um, it's sort of web-based. It's kind of nice. Um, it requires a little bit of setup once, uh, but it's basically a little a little engine, a little daemon that can run on your machine, whether it's your lab machine or your laptop, or uh, and can copy uh, data from there to Signet and vice versa. You just say, okay, here's my listing of my Signet uh, files, here's a listing of my local files, and you just click, up, click on them and they, they transfer. And it does this behind the scenes. Um, it does things like, okay, if it fails, I'll try again. Um, and it'll try multiple paths, so it'll, it'll actually be pretty fast. So it's a, it's a nice, Interface, it's, it's, it's good for bigger uh, transfers. The only, uh, the only thing is, if it has to be able to restart, this little program has to run on your machine all the time. Right? It doesn't do anything even if you're not copying, but you can't just shut it off. Um, if this is a, a, a workstation, it's probably not a big deal. Uh, another thing you can use Globus for is copying files from one data center in Canada to another data center in Canada. So you've got stuff that's running on in Quebec somewhere on one of their supercomputer systems, and you want to copy it to, uh, to Signet, um, you, can, you can use Globus as well, and it actually uses the, the fast network that uh, these uh, sites are connected with uh, to do that. So it's, it's a very efficient way to do that as well. OK. HPSS is a different story. You need a script. There's a wiki page for it. So once you get to that point, uh, come talk to us or, or read it through. And, uh, will help you out. And more info, apart from the support at sign at email. Um, this is our front page, but that's just uh, funky, uh, nice, nice stories. And, and the wiki is where you find most of your technical information. Um, and the education side is where you hopefully found this intro. Um, it's, uh, it has a lot of the PDFs of lectures and, and uh, recordings too often. And it'll tell you what's what's up in the in the next future in terms of uh, education and training. And then there's a portal where you do things like changing your password, um, your allocations, and uh, mail list subscriptions, and stuff like that. Although more and more of this is, is pushed through uh, Compute Canada's database. Um, but these things, I think, are still done here. So I know that this is a lot. Um, a super computer is not the same as your laptop or as a desktop. Um, just get going with it. If you have any questions, email us. Um, we all see all the emails that go to support, so you'll probably get a quick response in the, uh, don't be shy. OK? There's a sign user group meeting at noon after this. There's a talk. Memory consistency in parallel applications. If you want to stick around, you're welcome to. Um, okay. uh, you're welcome to. Um, uh, there's going to be pizza with it too, so that's nice. However, if you ever signed up for it, there's not going to be a lot of pizza left. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs>